to me, one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century that has had a profound impact on me are audiobooks. And audiobooks have completely transformed the game. Because now, while I'm going on a bike ride, while I'm working out, while I'm eating food, while I'm driving, I can play an audiobook. And within a span of week, I'm finishing a book. And the best part is, is I'm not even paying for the book because the local library is willing to buy all of the books for us. And there have been weeks where I've been finishing two books a week. And these aren't the most intensive books, but I've been able to read books on health, on history, on philosophy while I've been working out. And I've been able to retain most of that information. And so now I'm able to quickly speed up my reading because there are a lot of people out there who are eating through books through audiobooks. And although there's a specific time and place where audiobooks are not good with certain books, it's completely transformed the game. And if your excuse is that you don't have time, you're always on the go, well, audiobooks is the cure for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of the Ahmed Khan podcast. We hope all of you are enjoying it. If you have any other feedback, please let us know. We are opening, we're open to inviting new speakers, speaking on topics that you are interested in because this podcast is first most for you. And so today I would like to reintroduce one of our earliest guests, Brother Hassan Munir, who spoke with us on the topic of the golden age of Islam. And just very quickly, a recap about Brother Hassan, Hassan is that he has his bachelor's in history and he is pursuing his master's at the University of Toronto in Middle Eastern history. And he is one of the gems we have in the Canadian community in terms of history and Islamic history. So thank you for joining us, Hassan. Jazakallah khair, Brother Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum to you and to all the viewers. So... Getting straight into the topic, this is a topic that's been in demand for some time now because most of our uh, listeners are readers and most of them are actually avid readers. And so reading is something which is very powerful. It's something which is found in the Quran. The first word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed was iqra. It was read. It was not listen. It was not speak, but it was read because knowledge is needed before we can act. And so reading is something that I know personally has completely transformed my life. And um, I think people can get that just from looking at the bookshelf behind me. <laughs> um, but read it, reading is something which is foundational to the Islamic civilization. And Franz Rosenthal, the great Jewish historian, said that no civilization has ever existed in human history, which placed a larger emphasis on the acquisition of knowledge than the Islamic civilization, because that is who our ancestors were. And that's how they were able to make these remarkable contributions to human history. And so the first thing I wanted to ask you, Hassan, is how has reading transformed your life? I know that you're a have you know, you love reading in your spare time, but what has it done to you personally? That's a very loaded question. Um, I think reading is uh, something that um, becomes an important uh, part of your life, part of your lifestyle uh, in so many different ways. So I read for leisure and I read for my research work that I do. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to blur the line right? Um, and which one am I doing? So it, it really becomes something that, um, you know, it's something you do for fun, right? It's something that helps you relax. It's something that helps you slow down. Because if you think about it, um, reading, at least for me personally, I know some people are speed readers, mashallah, which is amazing. I am not, right? I like to take my time to read. Um, and so it's one of the only activities that consumes a certain amount of my time, um, which isn't very like 
flashy and fast. So if I'm on my phone, if I'm doing my uh, social media, public history work, if I'm watching, um, you know, some kind of lecture, even uh, I might watch it on like, you know, 2.0 speed or 1.5 speed just because I need to get through it, etc. So um, all of these forms of acquisition, but when you're actually reading, it's difficult, right? Um, unless you want to miss part of the experience to kind of you can't just skip over like 10 pages, right? Um, when you're doing research and you're just looking for one specific thing, yes, you might do that. Just skip to a particular chapter in a book, not read the whole thing. But even then you have this sense that um, there may be a context that I'm missing, right? You can't just um, pick and choose from pages of a book. You kind of have to go through the process and make sure you get a proper understanding and all the relevant details, which are on page 59, because you might read from, you know, page uh, 57 to 58 and then skip to like 62, but there's one detail on 59 that would help you make sense of all of that, mm -hmm. right, in a different kind of way. Um, so it really slows down and lets your brain, I think, uh, reset. Now, I don't know the, the kind of neuroscience behind this. That's not something I could tell you, um, but I can tell you like from an anthropological perspective, um, humans have a very long, uh, kind of uh, long developed relationship and developing relationship uh, with the written word, with, with text, right? Uh, with physical contact with paper. And it's been such an instrumental part of our lives, such an important part of our lives. Something we may not appreciate anymore because nowadays we have, you know, e-ink and phones and these kind of things, but just that physical contact with paper and the meaning of it and the value of that. Um, so I think all of those things, if you continue to maintain that habit um, of reading regularly, you get a sense of fulfillment. It's a very fulfilling kind of experience, right? Um, where you are learning, you're gaining knowledge, um, you are slowing down uh, your kind of cognitive process, your kind of learning process to the pace that, I guess, from an evolutionary perspective, it has been. Again, I'm theorizing based on how I feel. I'm not kind of, you know, mm -hmm. I hope no like neuroscientist is like rolling their eyes or, or, or anyone else who's an expert in a related field, right? And then it's, and then it's, it's fun, it's enjoyable. It's a way to escape from your own reality um, and momentarily, especially when you're reading about history, which is what most of my reading is, to escape from your own reality and to just be in a different place, right? And to... Imagine. So this is the difference like between watching to a historical movie, for example, or a documentary and reading, because when you are reading, you are taking those words and your own mind is painting the picture for itself to kind of visualize, right? When you're watching something, the visual is given to you. So a lot of decisions have already been made. A lot of framing has already been done where the story is more from that storyteller's perspective. When you're reading, yes, you're taking it from someone's perspective, but you also have more of a role as the storyteller. You're telling that story to yourself and visualizing for that for yourself, you know, in your mind. So I think all of that is um, part of a very, very good experience on a regular basis. And then on the macro level, obviously, you know, doing that regularly, it opens your horizons so much again that escaping your own reality and going to other times and places um, and other people's experiences different ways that people have experienced and engaged with the world you get to try all of that um, mm -hmm. through the means of a book um, and that of course comes back and helps you put things into perspective which is what a lot of decision making in life is putting things into perspective Right. And that is a key part of the process. Um, and so, again, like I said, it's a very loaded question. So if you could continue to like unpack that, but I'm sure you have follow up questions that will cover a lot of that. So I'll leave it there. But it's a beautiful experience. You know, everybody has habits. Right. Most of us listening are in school when we're done finishing studying um, in our in our spare time. There's something that we're doing for some of us because because we all need a way to escape reality. Some people use social media as a means of getting away. Some people use video games. Some people use TV shows or movies, but they want things, something to calm their mind down. Some people have recreation sports. And so the one habit that I took 
and that I replaced uh, not all of my other habits, but it became my dominant one. It became reading. And so I had friends that used to make fun of me where I would do my school homework and then I would be tired and they would take a break and they would just watch some TV and I would go to my personal reading. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I felt more fulfillment because I think there's something to human psychology where if you're forced to do something, no matter how much you like it, it'll be seen as a job and something which you don't really have a passion for. But when it's something that you're doing in your spare time, it's something you enjoy. And I'll tell you something very funny as I was once in a history class and I did my degree in history and our teacher had given us this textbook to read. And while I was reading it, I had to write an assignment on it. I found it so boring. And years later, after I, uh, I finished that class, I looked at that book again and I said, I want to read this book. And while I was reading it, I was like, this is one of the most amazing books I've read. And it's because nobody was forcing me. And so the thing I think people have to acknowledge is not everybody is a reader, but readers are leaders. And the science is very clear on that, that nations, the nations that have the highest number of books read per person are the ones that are prospering the most. And those are the most intelligent people. And so reading is something that we need to get back. In fact, I love reading so much. I almost named this podcast, Read and Rise. <laughs> right. Um, it was the, I was stuck between these two names. But when I look at reading, and I want to get your thoughts on this, the person I see that really exemplifies reading and how reading completely transformed his life was Malcolm X. May Allah be pleased with him. Oh, and yeah. when Malcolm X was in prison, he explained what his life was like before. His nickname was Shaitan, you know, Satan, the devil. Um, he was a pimp. He was a drug dealer. But once he began reading, he felt like this. And he says in his autobiography that this whole other world opened up to him. And from that moment forward, he said, the only thing I was doing aside from sleeping and eating was I was reading. And he used to stay up late at night and he would sit in the near the near the jail cell because the light was there. And he would read until at the end of every hour, the officer would walk by and he would pretend to go back to sleep. And the officer would leave and he would come back and he would continue reading. And he says that's where he got his glasses. But his life is a clear indication that reading can have a completely transformative effect on the human being. And if reading can take him from being a drug dealing pimp to being perhaps the most eloquent, influential person of his time within his community in a span of maybe a decade, then that's an attest, uh, uh, then that's a proof of the power of reading. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's important to point out related to what you just said is reading is a privilege, right? Um, if you think about the number of people in the world who don't have that very basic education that would enable them to read, or they don't have access to things like libraries, or they have libraries, but they're not well maintained, they're not uh, offering them sort of quality uh, material, right? The access is not very easy, or they just don't have time, even if they do know how to read, but their lifestyle is such, um, you know, they are trying to uh, survive and, and uh, basically, you know, climb the economic ladder to whatever extent is possible and take care of their families, or they're caught in uh, a conflict or so many different situations you can imagine where you just don't imagine a person saying, hey, I can regularly kind of go find a book, grab it, grab a book from somewhere, sit down comfortably and, and read it, right? Um, so it's, it's so important what you said about, you know, the, the connection between, um, you know, reading and leadership, right? Um, the connection between reading and being able to influence change, right? I mean, Malcolm had a particular trajectory um, and he was given access to some extent and his own curiosity and his own personal drive um, and his own kind of determination to learn is something that gave him ever increasing access, even though he had come from a background where um, that necessarily would not have been the priority, right? Um, reading would not have been the priority. So, but he got into that mode. But there are many, many people 
who, um, you know, just will never have that kind of access. And that's something that's for, for me and, and you to acknowledge as well, because I think oftentimes we as readers, we kind of um, don't think about, you know, we do think about why others don't read, right? But we don't think about um, why others can't read. And there's, there's like a difference, like a, mm. a perspective shift there, right? Why others can't read. And even uh, I remember reading <laughs> from a sociological perspective that, um, there, there's three markers now, like it used to be literacy and a literacy, uh, sorry, literacy and illiteracy were the two kind of, uh, you know, ends of the spectrum um, of uh, basically measuring the progress of a community of a society of an individual, like, are you literate? Are you partially literate? Or uh, how many languages, you know, all those kinds of things. But now there's a third one, which is a literacy, which is people who have the ability to read um, and have the opportunity to read, but they choose not to, hmm. right? So now there's a third one. So in a lot of um, quote unquote developed nations, a lot of people have access to books, to libraries, to bookstores, they can borrow a book. They have that comfortable lifestyle into which they could easily incorporate reading, but they just choose not to because you know life is completely consumed by Netflix and other sort of sources of entertainment and fulfillment. Right. So they're just choosing not to. So there's this concept of a literacy now. So absolutely. I think it's, it's um, you know, I, I don't have anything to add really to what you said about the very, very clear connection between reading and developing certain uh, knowledges, developing certain skills uh, that will then facilitate for you to take a leadership position within communities, within uh, societies and to then influence change, hopefully positively, right? If you read the wrong things, obviously you might be influencing change, but maybe not in the best way. And we know examples of that as well, especially as a historian, right? Um, but at the same time, um, as readers, we also have to think about how can I facilitate this uh, privilege that I have for somebody else, right? How can I enable reading for somebody else? How can I, even in terms of generating interest, if people aren't interested, right? Um, how can I sort of generate that interest through my own work, even through conversations like this, mm. right? Readers coming together and all those kinds of things. So um, Malcolm, it's it was a blessing uh, for, for all of us, for all of the people who have, you know, benefited through him, um, who have been inspired by him. It was a blessing for all of us that he had that experience. He was able to get that access and get that connection and then make that a lifelong habit. And his curiosity is just amazing. I mean, anyone who, who any anytime you hear about Malcolm and he didn't live for a very long time, he was martyred very early on, right? But in the space that he had between the period you're talking about, his first transition in life uh, to the point when he was martyred, I mean, that's not a very long time in terms of years, but his curiosity, his drive, and then the access that he was able to obtain. Um, and, and those two go hand in hand, right? When people, you know, it's, it's also on you. Like a lot of times, for example, people will say things like, like a New Year's resolution. My New mm -hmm. Year's resolution is to read like 52 books a year, or like one book a week or something like that, right? But it's, you know, the, it's, it doesn't last very long. It collapses very quickly. And I've done that before a lot of times, right? Set a certain goal and it collapses very quickly. So it's on the reader or the aspiring reader as well, you know, to not just wait for the opportunity to come to you or someone to come hand you a book and open the page for you and say, like, point the finger, start here, right? You have to be a little outgoing as well, right? Mm. Understand the benefits of this habit, of this lifestyle that reading builds, um, and then go out and put yourself in positions, in situations, in spaces where you will be encouraged spend some time in the library, spend some time in the bookstore, just browsing around doesn't have to be something specific. But you know, there, there's a lot of articles now, I'm sure you've read them as well about this concept of just surrounding yourself with books, buying books that you'll never, you know, you never actually, you're like, I'm going to read this, like, within the next three days, and then it sits there for like three years, but mm -hmm. there's still a certain benefit. Obviously, that's not ideal. And that's a habit that we have to kind of correct. But there's still a lot of benefit to just mm -hmm being in a reading environment, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so we're glad Malcolm was able to do that. 
uh, and so many other people who have done such incredible things who we are inspired by um, have gone through the same process. Mm. You know, you talked about this point of leadership and I'm going to reiterate the point. Readers are leaders. And there was a French philosopher in the 20th century named René Gounan who ended up converting to Islam. And he wrote his famous book, The Crisis of the Modern World. And he said, the problem with the modern world today is that there is so much action, but there's no knowledge. And without the knowledge, everybody is just acting, not knowing what exactly are the best policies to make, what is the best philosophy, what is the right theology that we need to take. And so when, when I think about my own podcast, this is an idea that's been brewing for some time now. For at least a year, it's been there. And I was always second guessing myself, telling myself, look, now is not the time. You still need to be more prepared. You still need to do more reading. Because I felt after, you know, the hundreds of books that I've read after a bachelor's degree in history, I still felt that I was not the right person to be speaking. And so I came up with this idea of getting people who are more knowledgeable than me to speak on the topics. And I merely act as like a facilitator. But this is something we really need to remind ourselves is that knowledge precedes action. And there's a hadith, a quite profound hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was, and I'm paraphrasing, who was speaking to the Sahaba and said, you are living in a time right now where there's so much knowledge. And so in this time, action is better than knowledge. But a time will come where the fuqaha, you know, the scholars will be few and there will be lots of action. During that time, knowledge will be better than action. And to me, we are living in those times. And for those people who are willing, who, want, who are wanting to be leaders within our own community, they will need to be the ones who are reading, the ones who have knowledge, who have an understanding of what's going on. And so um, I wanted to transition this to a very interesting topic, which is this idea of awakenings. Because in life, we go through different awakenings. We have what's called the spiritual awakening. Many of us come from a religious background. And there's a point in our life where the light finally turns on and we realize we need to start taking our religion seriously. That it's, we need to start praying without our parents telling us to. This is something that we are starting to love. And so that is a spiritual awakening that we have. Um, but Malcolm X, in his autobiography, said that people are always asking me how I became the person that I became. He said, to answer that question, you must first analyze the entirety of a person's life, all of the experience that happened to them. And after you've done that, you'll have an idea of how I became the person that I became, meaning his, you know, his, inter so you need to understand his intellectual awakening. And obviously we're not at his level, but from your perspective, can you recall the moment where the light flickered on, where you started to realize that, you know, this is something, a practice I really need to be engaging? You know, today we use the word woke, right? What was the moment where you became woke, Hassan? Uh, I'm looking forward to that moment, inshallah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because, um, again, like, we don't know what's coming, right? Um, and, and hopefully we always maintain this hope that, you know, um, what's to come is better than what has passed or what we are experiencing right now, right? So when it comes to such things as that intellectual awakening or, or um, a sort of personal enlightenment and those sort of things, it's like, I hope where I am right now isn't it. You know, I hope, I hope there's going to be like a, it, the, the turning point is still coming, inshallah. Um, I do think in terms of, reading specifically and and sort of making these um you know kind of realizing um that this this kind of knowledge and action relationship which you mentioned right um and and realizing um that i had to let's say turn in that direction right and start that journey i don't know the, you know, the peak of that mountain, where it is, or whether it's yet to come, or whether it's something that's already passed, I'm not sure, to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, uh, I think that itself is a blessing in disguise, because it, it makes sure um, 
that we keep pushing, right? That we don't become sort of complacent because um, we always want to, um, you know, although climbing the mountain is difficult, you want to hope that the mountain you're climbing is going to take you very high and you don't necessarily want to reach the peak, right? And, and I hope whoever's listening is getting the picture here. But um, for me, it was, it was really, I think, in, in university, um, during my undergraduate degree, I would say probably around um, when I was going into my third year. So I did a four-year degree. Um, and in the first two years, you know, I like to read um, for leisure and I like to read to learn. I had this curiosity, right? I just love to learn about things from since when I was a child. Alhamdulillah, that, that's something that, you know, that's a blessing I've enjoyed since childhood. Um, and, and growing up as well, you know, reflecting on the different kinds of, especially fiction literature. So I'll, I will give fiction a shout out because that's what they make you read in high school. I'm not personally very much inclined to read fiction anymore because I don't find the time and energy for it because I have to read so much nonfiction. Um, but it does, you know, from the experiences I've had with fictions, most of it, some of it is just nonsense, right? But uh, in my opinion, but some of it, uh, I mean, most of it, I think is it really helps you um, challenge your, your own by beliefs and ideas and all those kinds of things um, and, and kinds of shapes your perspective and gives you a sense of a very broad world. Like you just kind of imagine a person who's reading, um, you know, stand like it's like a, the portrait of like a small person standing under like a starry sky, like huge, right? Like a vast expanse that you're looking up at. Um, and so much to explore there. So I had all of that, like different kind of experiences with reading, but when I got to like the beginning of my third year of university, um, and I think part of it is a bigger question of, okay, what am I doing with my life, hmm. right? Like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to achieve? What are my, my goals? When you start to think of those bigger questions, um, I mean, reading is a means towards that end, hmm. right? Um, and, and like you said, knowledge is a means towards that end. Action is a means towards that end, right? We don't just read something uh, for the sake of like, like reading it on its own, right? A, a, a Muslim's actions should always be more pur purposeful than doing something for just the sake of doing it, right? Hmm. Even when I'm out there playing basketball or I do a road trip and go to the beach or something like that, it should always be part of like a bigger purpose, um, something more meaningful than just that action itself. So that was the moment when I kind of started to grapple with these bigger questions, especially around making Islamic history more accessible for people and how that, in, you know, in turn would inspire and inform change particularly within the Muslim community, telling our own stories within the context of, you know, an, an increasingly Islamophobic environment uh, all over the world, or at least in, in a large, uh, you know, section of the world. When I started to dig into all of that and how I related and what my purpose was within, uh, you know, the broader kind of scope of this work, that was the point when I had my, if you want to call it an intellectual awakening, I feel like it was more of a process. And I think, you know, I, I don't, I know you're not, I know you don't mean to kind of like say that, oh, like pinpoint it, right? But it's, it's a process. Everyone's a work in progress, mm -hmm. right? Um, and everyone's habits, including reading, are always a work in progress. Um, there's been times when I just kind of stopped reading for a few months, right? Um, and, and just because you, you go through a process. And then there's been times when, I was reading maybe more than I should have in a particular space of time. And maybe I was neglecting some other aspects of life I should have been focusing on. But I think really it was that moment um, that I began that journey. Uh, I began climbing that mountain um, and uh, I am still climbing that mountain. Hmm. And we all are, because this is something you study from the cradle to the grave, right? right. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, and always remaining in a state of humility because you know, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أُوتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا That we've only given you a little bit of knowledge. And so, Absolutely. you know, we could read all of the books in the library. I could read all of the books here. Um, it's still a drop in the ocean of the knowledge that Imam al-Ghazali has. And he could, he would be the first to tell you that he is a drop in the ocean of the Prophet 
And the Prophet وسلم, would be the first to admit that he's a drop in the ocean compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's, a, there's an Arabic proverb that says, I think it's فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Over everybody who knows something, there's somebody who knows more until we get to Allah. And so we, we're always, like you mentioned, in this state of growth. We're always learning more. And whenever we read more, you know, I always, like I, I analyze myself like every couple months. And after every couple months, I'm like, you know what? I knew so much more than I knew in the past. And then sometimes, you know, the ego starts to grow a bit. But a couple months later, you learn more and you're like, I never knew anything back then. <laughs> and you see, you're always reevaluating yourself. And I think that's just how life is. And especially when it comes to reading. Um, and so the big question I want to ask you, which I know is the big question everybody is hoping to take away from this podcast, is um, what book has had a transformative effect on you that you feel that people need to be reading? And just before you answer that, I will preface that we are not joking, nor are we, um, you know, exaggerating when we say that the greatest book we've ever read is the Quran. Um, that it's not an exaggeration. Like I will straight up say like, Wallahi, I swear there's, you can combine every book I've ever read. It does not come close. Um, and, you know, honestly, I would be completely fine if you just said the Quran and you explained that. But, they, but unfortunately, some people, you know, they want other suggestions. So I will first put that out there. So aside from the Quran, what is one book that you feel that readers have to be reading? that will transform their life? Uh, let me say, first of all, just based on what you were mentioning before you asked the question, um, I recently saw a picture of a scholar in Pakistan. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, I can't recall his name. Um, and I didn't know him. He's, he's not one of the more famous ones, um, but I just learned about him through the picture and the caption. So in the picture, he is... Um, sitting in a hospital bed um, and he is um, basically hooked up to like all of these machines and he's clearly like a very elderly person um, and I believe uh, it was COVID uh, that he had and the complications related to COVID that kept him in the hospital and he passed away may Allah have mercy on him I mean, but in that particular picture uh, taken I would assume within the past few months uh, or quite recently um, he has all these machines, like he has the oxygen mask and all these needles and things going into him. And he's sitting in his hospital bed with a book, right? And he, he is reading the book and it's like, you know, he's, <laughs> you, you know that, I mean, we even know that he passed away. Like he was literally clearly feeling some kind of weakness and, um, and, and, you know, someone who's probably been a scholar for a very long time and, and, and done a lot of great work and may Allah accept it from him. Um, but man, like when I saw that picture, it just reminded me like it just a rush of stories came back to me of the scholars of the distant past. Uh, when you read about them and uh, you kind of get all like these almost like too good to be true kind of moments from their lives and especially the last moments of their lives where like, like Al-Biruni was discussing an economic problem, like literally a minute before he died, like on his deathbed, mm -hmm. one of the people came and, you know, tried to like console him. And he's like, Hey, what did you figure that out? The thing we talked about like years ago, right? Like after, after decades and decades of doing scholarship, they're continuing that. So just, just to give a visual, right. Related to what you just said about literally from the cradle to the grave. Um, coming to the question that you so, asked, so, let me, I'm just going to interrupt Sorry. you. I'm yeah. going to cut this part out. So I'm, I'm going to ask you the question again. Because I want to comment on that. Um, okay. I, ha I have an aunt. Uh, I have an aunt who was doing her alama course, which was an eight-year-long intensive course. And while she was sick, she was still writing all of her exams. Um, because for her, she understood, you know, there's the beautiful hadith of the Prophet wasallam that if the end of time comes and you're planting a seed, plant the seed, meaning don't give up until things are officially over. And for her, 
while she was on her deathbed, she wrote her last alima exam. And she passed the exam she pa and she passed away soon after that, but she completed her degree. SubhanAllah. And she completed, and I, I went to her graduation with my mother and her aunt on behalf of her and stuff. And so, you know, you read these stories of some of these great, remarkable people of the past, like Al-Baruni, like you mentioned, but we have these giant scholars in our own families, in our own communities, Sure, they might not be as smart intellectually as these other people, but the willpower that they have is something which is unprecedented. The and spirit is the same, right? The spirit is the same. And let me just add a quick yeah. example, um, for especially for Canadian listeners who will be aware of this. Um, uh, Sister Madiha Salman, uh, who was one of the people killed in the London attack mm. uh, in June, um, was on the verge of completing her PhD. Uh, and she completed her, it was awarded to her like posthumously, like, you know, two, I, I believe a week or a half ago, right? Um, so she, all these years spent in that pursuit of knowledge, and she did not even live to receive the degree. But we are confident that any benefit that comes out of that work that she did, out of that PhD dissertation that she wrote, any benefit that comes up will be a sadaqa jariya for her mm -hmm. until the end of time, right? So it's, it's, it's just beautiful how this works, right? So I, sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted to include that in there as mm -hmm. well for Canadian listeners especially will uh, be aware of that. And you see the, the common thing between both examples is they're both women, Yeah. right? And, um, you know, as big as my library is here, I could show you my mom's library and it's much bigger. Um, mashallah. And she always makes fun of me, mashallah, about that. But if there's one hadith all of the viewers can take from this, just memorize this one hadith. The Prophet wasallam said, whoever sets out on the pursuit of knowledge, Allah will put them on the road. Whoever set, The Prophet wasallam said, whoever sets out on the road to knowledge, Allah will put them on the road to paradise. And so entering onto that road is all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking. You don't have to make it to the end because nobody will make it to the end. Every time you read one book, you're recommended a dozen others. It's just a matter of getting on that road. And so when we talk about how reading can change your life, it can change your life, yes. And we've cited examples for Malcolm, like Malcolm X, but it can also change your next life, which is even more important. And so now, you know, as a conclusion, I want to ask you the big question, which is what is that one book, that one book that has had a transformative effect upon you and that you feel that people need to read? I think, um, you know, the, the standard answer to this is the Quran. Um, but of course, um, when people ask this question, they themselves are also aware of that, you know, most of the time, right? So they're looking for recommendations other than the Quran. So it's, it's I don't want to go into that discussion, but obviously, you know, prefacing what I'm about to say with uh, duly mentioning the ultimate book, right? The final book, Allah's final message to humanity um, and the depths of it and all of the knowledge contained within it. Um, and just a reminder for myself and for you and for everyone who's listening um, to re-engage, to, to constantly be making an effort to re-engage and to learn more and more about it while we also look into other sources of knowledge and while we also look into um, you know, uh, reading other books. And that itself is something that's inspired by the Quran. Um, and so in terms of um, my uh, book that has been very transformative for me in that sense, um, and I don't necessarily, you know, one thing I want to, another thing I want to say in, in prefacing is that when oftentimes when you get asked this question, people are like, well, what's been a transformative book for you? So you mentioned the book and then the assumption is there that, okay, it was transformative for him. 
it's also going to be transformative for me, right? Mm. Uh, which isn't necessarily the case. We're all on our different paths. Every time we read something, we're engaging that new information that we're gaining with all the information, all the data, for lack of a better term, that we already have. And that includes our experiences, books we've read in the past, right? Our feelings, our particular backgrounds, our ways of interpreting things, our attitudes, all of that plays into what we get out of a book. So what I get out of a book may not necessarily be what somebody else gets out of it and vice versa. So also keep that in mind. Um, but the book for me, which I think generally for a vast majority of people is, is a beautiful um, book to read, um, is uh, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by Martin Lings. Right. Um, it's, it's officially titled Muhammad, his life based on the earliest sources. Um, it's I think it's a fairly well known book, not as well known as I would like it to be. But people who do digging around this topic and want to read about the Sira uh, generally come across the book very quickly is what I'm trying to say. Now, one thing I have to mention is that, you know, these books aren't perfect, of course. Right. Um, and especially uh, this book, there are some uh, kind of caveats and challenges to keep in mind, um, like, uh, you know, that other scholars have pointed out that there are some inaccuracies or some things have been described in a way where there may have been a better way to describe it. And if you look at that as well, uh, if you look that up, so for example, if you search up uh, Martin Ling's uh, Sira and then um, corrections or something like that in Google, fairly quickly you will come across the um, documents from scholars, uh, and Martin Lings was a scholar himself, right, but from other scholars who have corrected that, and that's just part of the process, right? Um, but what Martin Lings did with that book, and as far as I'm aware, it still hasn't really, it's been decades since he wrote that book, right? Um, and he passed away, I believe, in 2004, um, but may Allah have mercy on him, and mm -hmm the way he wrote that book in a narrative style as if you are really reading a story because a lot of the English literature on the life of the Prophet وسلم, is written in a very like encyclopedia kind of format, right? It's like fact number one, fact number two, mm. fact number three, we're jumping, right? Um, and the way he brings out the relationships of the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba and the non-Muslims, the Quraysh uh, and the non-Muslims, uh, the Jews, and as well as the um, uh, Arab tribes of Medina and uh, the tribes of the Arabian Peninsula, um, you know, the relationships between people, the way he transitions from one stage, from one uh, sort of known detail about the life of the Prophet وسلم, to the next, um, the way he uh, the vocabulary that he uses and, you know, words can be loaded with meaning, you know, and especially I think in English, um, we often don't get to use a lot of words that are loaded with a lot of meaning, but English is, I mean, you know, not to berate it as a language, there are some words in English where you, that really capture a lot more imagery than the common alternative that we would typically use in a conversation. Right. So when things are written that way, what people call like, well, Shakespearean English, it's not necessarily that, but it flows. Right. It flows. It's like, you know, it's a it's what they call in a book, a page turner. Right. Even if you already know the life of the Prophet, وسلم, the way it's written is like when you reach the end of a chapter, it's hard to put it down. You want to like, OK, where does it pick up next? Like, where do we go next mm -hmm. from here? Right. So that's one book that was. I started reading it, I believe, when I was 16, 17, um, and I finished it fairly quickly. And I read it again and again and again, uh, countless times. I'm not sure how many times, right? Um, and may Allah bless immensely the person who first gave me a copy and encouraged yeah. me to read it. Because that, um, for me personally, as someone who already had an inclination to sort of learn about history, um, and as someone who wanted to tell Muslim stories and no Muslim story, no aspect of Islamic history is more important than the life of the Prophet وسلم, itself. And so at a young age for me to come across that was like, okay, this is not necessarily something that I would replicate, but the spirit 
right? The spirit, the, um, the kind of uh, drive in that direction that this is the kind of work that we need to do. Personally, that's where it started for me, right? Um, and so it's that book, you know, I, 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 wanna pe I want people to kind of discover it for themselves, um, read it again, keeping in mind the caveats, right? Um, one of the most important things to about reading and especially today is don't be, you know, elongate that uh, reading to sharing pipeline, right? It's like, oh, I read something, I read like page three of a book, I need to quote it right away on, on Instagram or something, right? And, and I feel that tug as well, because sometimes you read something so good, you want to share it with others right away, and you want others to be reading it and all of that kind of thing. But get through it, give it some thought, give it some reflection, learn more about the author, the publisher, all of this is part of the process, right? Especially if it's a book that you feel very strongly about, learn as much as you can about it, talk to someone else about it who may have read it, get their perspective before, you know, loosely starting to share it everywhere in different kinds of formats. Um, so, you know, I, I want everyone to kind of um, keep those things in mind as well. Um, but at the same time, it's a beautiful piece of literature. So not just for readers, but also what hopefully reading will inspire in a lot of people in the Muslim community is writers, right? Mm -hmm. Reading and, and, and writing is a special kind of relationship. Um, and so hopefully it will get you thinking, especially if um, you know, you're someone who's interested in things like um, da'wah, uh, and the relationship between giving that giving da'wah and creativity. How do we make our da'wah more creative? How do we make our da'wah more appealing? How do we spread the message of Islam um, to different audiences? Uh, you know, it's all of these things. If you're interested in this kind of work, especially read that. And then generally, if you are a Muslim, you cannot love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you do not know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you do not know his life story, and oftentimes we learn a hadith, like his teachings, his sunnah, we learn it in like bits and pieces in isolation, and the context, like the very real life relatable story within which that teaching emerged is lost, right? Mm -hmm. And so because the context is lost, we're not really able to connect those teachings to our own context. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he lived a very human life, and that's something that comes out very, very vividly in this book. Right. And so we need to learn about that human life so we can put his teachings into context and then, you know, relate the context with our own lives and then, you know, imbibe those teachings into our own lives, inshallah. So um, hopefully that'll be a good experience for everyone to read that book, Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by uh, Martin Lings, whose uh, I think the, air, the name he had taken on was. Um, after his conversion was Abu Bakr Siraj al um, mm. and uh, he passed away, rahimahullah, in 2004. You know, I'm so happy you brought up this specific book because, because I can relate personally with it. When I first began reading, I was reading the biographies of many of the most influential people that existed. And I was reading these books on comparative religion. And there was a moment you know, and I think this was just an, you know, like an opening or something that Allah had sent me. But I, I, I was like, you don't know anything about the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Like, who are you to be reading about the biography of Abraham Lincoln, of the Buddha, and you don't even know the life of your own Prophet? And I remember that moment. I don't think I've ever felt more ignorant in my entire life than that moment. And immediately I went to the library. Um, I picked up one of the biographies. I'm not sure which one. It might have been Martin Ling's. And I began reading it. And there was this awakening where I was like, what was I doing my whole time? Why did I not know about this information beforehand? Obviously, I had some precursor knowledge. But after I read it, I think I went to like on a, I, I, I just started reading a bunch of them. And so people want, you know, the answer people were looking for from you is some sort of secular book or some biography of this person. Um, and some people are going to hear that and say, oh, like, I already know the sirah. And my answer to you is no, you don't, because neither do we. 
because we're always having to relearn these same stories. And I'll give you an example. Um, I had read about the Battle of Uhud many times, right? You know, I, I listened to some podcasts about it. Uh, it was either, not Uhud, it was Badr, Battle of Badr. And there was a certain individual on Twitter. Um, uh, you might know his name. His name is um, Hassan Munir. <laughs> 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 and he had made a tweet which said, um, you know, it, it's a rainy night. The Sahaba are sleeping. And the Prophet ﷺ is making dua, getting ready for the battle the next day. And just that imagery there got me so fascinated. I said, this is just opening a whole nother lens onto this event now. You know, I, I, like you said, I just knew it as like a fact thing. They got there, they fought, they won. This is how it happened. But there was a beautiful biography I read, which uh, I don't think many people know of, which exists. And it's called Muhammad um, by, I think his name is Yahya Emmerich. It's like a critical lives edition. And it's a biography written in a completely um, narrative account. Like it's literally like you're reading like a fiction book. And I think I finished that in like a span of like a day, in a, in a day or day or maybe two days because it was literally written as like a storybook. And so uh, the point I'm trying to highlight is as many Sira books have you read, you still are nowhere close to actually understanding what occurred and neither are we. And that is the most important thing. Um, knowing about who our prophet is transcends knowing about all of the other figures. It's the first priority. Um, but with that being said, I know other people will want other recommendations as well. And so um, the book I've always been recommending to people, the book that has had a profound impact on my life, uh, many people in, in our community, like specifically in the lower mainland, know exactly the book I'm going to recommend because um, I've, I've, you know, I think the, the company, sh- the publisher should give me a contract for the amount of books that I've sold on it. <laughs> but it's none other than the famous autobiography of Malcolm X. And I think why that book is so profound, because it's a deep insight into Malcolm's life where he explained how he got to being where he was at, the lowest of society, to being a drug dealer, to being a person who was the most sought after person in the country after the president, somebody who was honored to speak at the world's largest universities. And his schedule couldn't fit in his time to speak everywhere. And he explains how ultimately the ending, how Islam came into his life and how it had a complete transformative effect on him and filled in that void that he was looking for. Because you're a person's uh, spirit. Everybody needs a a, a sense of a sort of metaphysics, a way of understanding the reality of the world. And Malcolm X ultimately found that in Islam. And by reading Malcolm X's journey, you will find parallels within your own self. And you begin to see the deep emotions that this individual had. So um, on my end, I feel like that was the one book that I've seen transformed many people into readers. And, and, and beyond that, I think, you know, transforming their entire lives, right? Like the number of people you hear about who are very inspiring and, and they've done incredible things in their own right. And then you try to learn a bit more about their story and the number of people where it sooner or later traces back to, you know, the autobiography of Malcolm X being that transformative book. It's incredible. And the power of the human story, right. Um, and, and kind of that, the glimpse into potential, right. Again, it's, it's a way of escaping from our realities, right. And, and Malcolm was someone who, whose reality was transformed um, not without great cost, not without great sacrifice, um, but he, 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 you know, kind of pushed for that. He kind of worked for that uh, very, very diligently. He worked very hard for it. He worked very honestly and sincerely for it. Um, and, and it resonates in that autobiography. It's, it's very candid, right? It's, it's very, uh, very personal. So um, definitely will echo you on that amazing book to read. Hmm. Exactly. And I, th- I think that's a good note to end off on is just, 
you know, reiterating this idea that reading is something which is a principle in our religion. It's something that all of us should understand. You know, the other book that I was really going to recommend is a book by National Geographic titled 1001 Inventions. And the reason why that book is so profound is that it's a book about the Muslim contributions to the world. What Muslims did in terms of math, in terms of culture, in terms of astronomy, in terms of uh, sociology, economics, literally everything. And it's, it's, it's honestly the most beautiful book I have in my library. Um, but the reason why that book is so profound is when you read it, you realize that, um, your ancestors, our ancestors were people who were very serious. They did not waste time. You know, one, uh, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf did a study on how many pages Imam Al-Ghazali wrote every day, um, during the period of his life when he was writing and every day he was writing 40 pages. 40 pages every, he was he was he was writing um because these people took life very seriously how do you have somebody like ibn sina a man who mastered the art of medicine and became a world class philosopher um who was who was a world class psychologist as well these things don't emerge out of nowhere yes there are openings that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people yes these people were very devout but these were also people who worked very hard and ultimately, their legacies are known through these books. We know Malcolm X because of his autobiography. We know Imam al-Ghazali because of his revival of the religious sciences. We know Ibn Sina because of his books on medicine. And so ultimately, like you mentioned, it's the writings that are going to last through time. The oral speeches, if not written down, are going to disappear. And so documenting the things that we have, and that's why... It's, uh, I, I'm really uh, proud of the work that you're doing in terms of history and canonizing a lot of the work that we have out there and just trying to show people that we are a people, despite the backwardsness that exists in large portions of the Muslim world, that this, is, this has only been going on for a very short period of history. And there are people who don't want us. And I will conclude, uh, and I'll give you the last say, from uh, a famous saying from the British historian Arnold Toynbee. And it's a very profound quote that I think all of us should always remember. And understanding that the highest people in government, the highest people in the United States government still read Arnold Toynbee. And they know this quote from Toynbee, which I'm going to state. He said, woe unto the West if we wake up the giant of Islam like we did in the past. And he understood that when the Muslim civilization was awake and it was thriving, there was no other civilization on the planet like it. And the historian Marshall Hodson said that in the 16th century, if an alien came into this world, he would have assumed that the world was on the borderline of becoming Muslim. Because at that time, the greatest empires were the Ottomans were the Mughals, were the Safavids, and several others. But this is who our civilization was. And if we want to begin to see a revival, if we want to see, if we want to stop living in the past and recreate the past into the future, ultimately the way we're going to do it is through reading. And hopefully, inshallah, this podcast was the beginning of trying to inculcate a sense of love for reading into the hearts of people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, love that conclusion. Um, and I'll, I'll just add, you know, sometimes there's a lot of like how to read kind of stuff on the internet, right? Um, which is oftentimes, of course, where we're going to end up. Like if I want to learn how to do something or start doing something I don't have experience with, I'll go to Google too, right? Um, it's like going to the gym you know, um, you can ironically read about going to the gym as much as you want, but the real experience is when you're actually there and you do something there, right? So um, to people who are listening out there and listening to this discussion, and maybe you've heard other conversations and other things, um, try to benefit from it. And we pray that Allah puts benefit in it. Um, but open a book, right? Grab a book, 
open a book um, and just start reading a little bit at a time is, is going to be the most important step in inculcating this process. Don't just read about reading and then never actually get to reading as, as weird as that sounds. But um, from my own personal experience as well in the past, that's often you know what happens. We try to um, uh, make it like a mechanical process. Okay, I need like step one, step two, step three. And then if step two is missing, then that's it, right? Um, but just grab a book, ask your friends for recommendations, think of things that you already have an interest in, you know, the topics that you're already interested in and look up new books or some of the best books that are known within that particular field or on that topic and just grab it and start reading. It's going to be the best way and hopefully will be beneficial for everyone. And with that, we will conclude. Jazakumallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.